All right. Hi, everybody. Keith Marciano, Senior Executive Coach, Pax8 Academy. Welcome to the Sales Pitch Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about uncovering prospects or client needs. So, uncovering prospect or client needs, better known as qualifying. When going through a sales process, it's not a race to the proposal. It's using your expertise, your unique selling proposition, the problems you solve for existing clients, and your ability to influence the buying criteria to win business. This means you need to determine if they're fit for you or not, if you're fit for them or not. When your primary goal is to help the client, then it's our job to find out what is actually wrong. What is their problem? The patient should not dictate the treatment. Prescription before diagnosis is malpractice, right? So we need to ask questions to find out what problems they're having, why they're having them, and why do we need to do this? So that way we don't sound the same as other IT service providers. So that way we don't commoditize our business. So how do you qualify your current prospects today? Do you just check their pulse to see if they have one and get them a quote? <laughs> a lot of us may do that. Do we ask a few questions kind of, hey, how many computers do you have here? Uh, how many employees? Hey, can you show me your technology room, your server room? Then just tell them how great you are and tell them what you do. Or do you ask them a bunch of questions to see if they're a good fit for us or not and why? Gut feel approach is what a lot of IT providers do, right? The basics. We all sound the same. We want to find out, do they value IT services? What problems is their business having that we may be able to solve with technology? This is what we want to answer in this process. So I hope you enjoy today's podcast. All right. Welcome back to the show, Jeremy Nelson. Jeremy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Keith. Thanks for having me back. Excellent. Glad to have you. Hope to have a lot of fun like we did last time. Anytime I talk to you, it's fun, Keith. That's right. We do have fun. <laughs> we do have fun. Sometimes at each other's at either each other's demise, but it's fun. <laughs> we laugh Only about from it. Love, Keith. Only oh, from love. That's okay? right. From the heart. I mean, you're an oil, uh, oil um, an Orioles fan, how much more pain can I give you? Let's be honest. That's right. That's right. Especially we're on top finally. You know, hey, we had we have one good year. Hope to have a second one. So yeah, not if my Rays can help you, but we'll see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. That's what's fun about the American League East. Yes. So anyway, why don't you, uh, mm -hmm. for anybody who didn't tune in the last time, why don't you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Tell tell the audience about yourself. Sure. For those who haven't seen me speak before, I've done a lot of things in my life, but the things you're going to care about on this podcast is I ran my own MSP for 20 years, and I was a salesman owner. Um, then I sold it. I actually worked as an outside sales rep for a major hardware manufacturer. I carried a quota. I know all about that stuff. Tons of fun, especially when they change your quota every quarter. I'm sure for those who've ever been to real salespeople, you love that part of your job. And then along with that, uh, for the last five, six years, I originally worked for C-Level as a operations coach. And for the last three years, I've been working as the sales coach manager, teaching MSPs, me and my team, how to sell better. Because there's one or, two, one or two of you out there who may not be selling as well as you'd like. So if, you, if you're one of those one or two, I'm glad you found this podcast because we're going to help you up your game a little bit. Yeah, perfect. I hope we can do that anyway. We're going to try. Yes, we will try. <laughs> All right. Jeremy, you and I have talked about this a lot. So many IT providers out there, they get an appointment, you know, they get the opportunity, and they become like Tommy Boy and his biscuit. So anybody hasn't seen the movie Tommy Boy, it's like Sales 101. you got to go watch that one. So he gets his biscuit. He's all excited. It's his new sale or is a new opportunity, he gets all excited and he basically crumbles the biscuit right in his hand. So that's what we do. We get all excited. And what are some of the things that you've seen and heard during your career, uh, especially here you know, at Pax8, that IT service providers do that is a mistake? Well, first of all, IT service providers, as you alluded to in your introduction, and I, 
I'll kind of add into that, right? Here is, I'm sure no IT provider has ever heard this when you get in front of a prospect, right? You have a meeting and they say, why should I do business with you? Oh, because I'm going to monitor all your equipment 24-7, right? And on top of that, if it does break, I'm going to fix it right away. And best of all, I have the bestest techs in the whole wide world, okay? So I'm sure one or two of you have heard that, and I'm probably sure a couple more of you have used that. And if that is how you are explaining yourself to your prospect, then guess what, guys? You are a commodity. Because one of the things that IT providers don't understand is that they're working with uneducated consumers. They don't know how to differentiate you from your competitors. So you all look the same. So if you all look the same, Keith, you know this answer. What's the only deciding factor when I make my buying choice? Price. Cash, right? Why should I pay more for the Snickers bar here when I can walk next door and get it for half price? All right? Right? And then I got worse news for you folks. Right? If you're a commodity and they're deciding on price, no matter how low you go, somebody's always going to be cheaper. Yeah, and then you also look at it from a standpoint of, you know, on top of that, even if you're the IT owner, you own the company, they know you're there trying to sell them something. Even though you don't think you're selling them something, which really you shouldn't, right? Let's let's get that out of the way first, right? Mindset is you're solving problems. What you know, one of the biggest things that people say about salespeople is they don't listen. So based on what you just said, Jeremy, is like if we just go out there and just bloviate all over them about how great our people are and how good our tools are and support is, right? We're we're just like every other salesperson, we're, we're not listening. We're just talking, right? Two ears, one mouth. There, there you go. And one of the things, so we've identified the problem, right? We've identified that this is what a lot of IT providers do. Let's talk about the solution, okay? Let me be clear, and I know this, I, I usually say to people, I don't want to give our secrets away, but since this is a podcast, and I'm sure millions will listen to it. Um, the, way, nice. the, way it works, the way it works is, guys, if you are people, if you're selling your services on making their computers run and that's what you think the value is you're communicating, I got bad news. Here's the here's the dirty little secret of our business. If you don't do anything to those computers, they're going to run 95 percent of the time. OK. And if our if our if our clients would learn to reboot them. They might get to 97. Okay. <laughs> All right? I mean, right? Right? let's be honest, right? So, so if your value, you're trying to show value for your 3% of that time, I got to tell you, you don't have much value. Okay? So when you're talking to a prospect, and when you're thinking about the service you provide, Maintaining their machines is, I'm a, I am ai like Vegas a bit, and I've been known to enjoy a craps table, but that's called table stakes, okay? If you can't keep their machines running, they're going to fire you, okay? There's no doubt, and I don't care how long that contract is they signed, okay? If you're not providing good service, they're not going to send you a check every month. Fair enough? Makes sense, Keith? That's fair. That's That's spot on. You nailed it on the head, right? They start talking, you know, you know, the industry is becoming commoditized because we're doing it to ourselves. You know, we're not asking good questions to for them to differentiate themselves, right? Well, and we're not differentiating ourselves, right? How many IT providers say, well, what, what industries do you focus on? And they're like, well, I don't focus on industries. I can fix any computers. Well, the answer is you can. It doesn't mean you should. OK, mm -hmm. what I would love IT providers to start thinking about is they are not bookkeepers, right? They're not computer repair shops. They are accountants and lawyers. OK, I, I hope this never happens to you, Keith. But if you ever need a criminal lawyer, I really, really hope you don't hire a contracts lawyer. OK, <laughs> right. I respect you too much. To be honest, I need you. All right. Don't want anything bad to happen to you. All right. And 
to be honest, if you need a contracts lawyer, I don't want you hiring a criminal defense lawyer. Right? All lawyers do the same thing. They, pra they, even, they even say it in their names. They practice. They don't even get it right. They just practice <laughs> law. Right? Right, right. Okay? So the same thing with an accountant. Right. If you're an owner or you're somebody watching this. Right. And you've ever had to hire somebody. Right. Accountants do the same thing. They count money. Accountant. OK. Most people use them to make sure that they pay the tax man. Right. Because you kind of don't want to mess that up. <laughs> I don't know why. No, don't. I don't know why, Keith, I've been worried twice now on this call that you're going to end up in jail. But oh. <laughs> just say it. Right? I have I spend good money on my accountant. So yeah. I'm glad to hear that person's an accountant. That person's account. Okay, so when you go to hire an accountant, if you're an MSP, right, and you, you most people get accounts through referral, right? You, most people don't look through a phone book. Maybe some do. Well, sorry, for those who Google, because you don't know what a phone book is. But, right, most people are going to get a referral from somebody they trust. And they're going to go to this accountant. And when the accountant talks to you, if you're an MSP and you say to the accountant, hey, how familiar are you with companies that use reoccurring revenue? And you and the accountant says, "Well, not much. I've never really done it." Does that make them a bad accountant, Keith? They're not a bad accountant, but they don't know much about your your business, though. Exactly. They're not an expert in your business, but that doesn't make them a bad accountant. Doesn't make them a bad accountant. They're just a bad accountant for you. That's right. There you go. Right? They're just a bad accountant for you. Right? The same way that I don't want to hire a criminal defense attorney to help me with my contracts. They're not, a, I'm sure they're a great criminal defense attorney. They're just not the attorney I need today. All right? Yeah, well said. Yeah. Great okay. analogies. I love it. All right. And so when you're an entire provider, become an expert in certain verticals. My usual recommendation is three. Okay? And I can hear everybody screaming on the podcast now. Well, I don't know. All my current clients are all over the place. All right. Let me give you a little hint, folks. It's very easy. I'm not suggesting. Remember, I ran MSP. So I'm not suggesting I ever did this in my own company. But this is just a thing that might have happened to another. No, we didn't do that. No, never. <laughs> so an example would be I walked into my service manager, and this is how you're going to know. And we were really good at endodontics. Not just dentists, but specifically endodontics. So when I went to my service manager and I said, hey, I just found another endodontic office, he got all excited. Great job, Jeremy. I'm really excited for you. We, we can handle it. Well, I'm sure we're going to do great by him. I said, wonderful. Thank you. Then there was that day that I walked in and I said, hey, I just signed a new car dealership. And they use Reynolds and Reynolds as their specialty software. What do you know about Reynolds and Reynolds? And my service manager looked right at me and said, I can barely spell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they probably weren't as pleased, right? Yeah. It, not only weren't they as pleased, but it took us a year to figure out how to get that Reynolds and Reynolds mm. to work. And let me just say that it wasn't a very profitable year. And you get really darn lucky if you get to keep that client, right? They realize, like, do, you, do these people really know my business? Like today, you know, what you and I did maybe even five years ago won't fly today. There's more people out there that claim themselves as MSPs or IT service providers. So, you know, people are, you know, small businesses now are looking for that subject matter expert, the one that knows their industry the best. So you're, you're going down the right path of at least this part. And like you said, we both made that mistake. It's like, you know, anybody's a client right maybe anybody shouldn't be we can't be all things to all people and eventually we can't scale it gets in the way of our, our ability to scale and to deliver high quality who wants to relearn every time right so if you don't know go to your service team and say hey, of all of our clients which one do we understand because every vertical has one specialty software or one trick that you've spent good money and time learning so how about we concentrate on that instead of every new industry learning their trick that's costing us money and, help, and not making us provide high quality service? Who do we understand? Who do we like, right? Who's, who's our best clients? Who do we enjoy working with that we know their business a little bit better than others? It's a great question to ask your service department. 
Exactly. And who do we, and then go back and see who you make money on. Who are the most profitable, right? So the industries you want to do are the ones where your service department knows how to the tricks of the trade for that industry, right? And that are very profitable. And usually they are combined because if I know the tricks, right? Then I make more money because I don't have to keep learning the same I have to I don't have to learn a mistake every time. I'll give you it's okay Keith, I'll give you another example. All right? We'll go back to my antidotics, right? Antidotics offices. There this is about, I'm again I'm showing my technology age, if not my actual age, right? Back in the day, antidotics care about one thing and one thing only, those doctors. They want to take pictures. Because if you've got a digital radiation pictures, right? They put that little probe in your mouth, right? Because if you're going to get your wisdom teeth removed, you don't really want to come back because the computer didn't work, right? Huh? Bad enough, I have to show up, right? Well, back in my day, the probes were not USB compatible yet. They had to have a card, right? Well, we discovered... <clears throat> after ordering 10 computers for a large endodontic office, that the motherboards had changed and the cards had not. So the slot was no longer available to get the card working to let the probe work. We call that a bad Tuesday in my life. Right? Right? So here I had made this huge mistake, right? Not really my fault. Right? Who knew? Right? I mean, I probably should have known, but you, I'm sure, I hope other people don't make it. And then I had to ship 10 computers back. I had to dig into the motherboards and I had to make sure that these machines had the right motherboard to support the card, which was the only reason the doc was buying the, car, the computers anyway. Right? Well, guess what, guys? I only wanted to learn that lesson once. Exactly. Exactly. So now when I go to endodontics offices, I would say to them, hey, do you know, does your, per whoever you're thinking about helping support you or supporting, do you know that the motherboards don't all, the new motherboards don't support the cards? Right? And all of a sudden, in 30 seconds, I have credibility. I know what they want the computers to do, their number one priority, and I know there's a trick that I've learned on somebody else's dime. When you look at this whole thing of identifying needs and that, you know, kind of getting to the, you know, we'll get into that in a second is like how we identify their problems, you know, but he who owns the problem owns the client. It's very difficult to commoditize a business problem, right? You can commoditize your service, your tools, your people. They can't commoditize your knowledge, your practical industry knowledge about them Hard to custom, hard to uh, commoditize that one, Jeremy. Absolutely. And let's go back to our attorney reference real quick, right? So, again, Keith, we're going to go with a contract lawyer. I'm a little worried about you, right? You go to buy a, con you got to find a contract attorney, right? And you call him up, and the first thing he tells you, or part of the conversation, do you know I'm the cheapest contract lawyer in town? Now, do you want to hire him more or less, Ken? Yeah. yeah. Keith, I'm sorry. less. I'm, I'm less, trying to get right? off some sort of, you know. Jail time, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I was hugging contract, but right. You know what? So, so if you are positioning yourself as an expert in the industry that you are supporting, and somebody says they're the cheapest, you've now positioned that that is a negative, not mm -hmm. a positive. Okay? There's a reason why attorneys get $500, $600, $800 an hour. Mm, right. Okay? And it ain't because of their good looks. All right, so we've established like industry expertise, their industry expertise, right? We talked about this commoditization. Um, all right, so now you get this opportunity, right? You're sitting in front of a prospect. Now let's get into the people side of things because individuals have different personalities, right? Some people are going to open up to you like you've known each other's, you know, for, for your entire life. And other people are really closed up and harder to get them involved in the discussion, harder to get information out of them. So how do you get people to open up in order to build trust? Okay. So the way you work on that 
is you ask questions, okay? First of all, if you're sitting in front of somebody or doing a Zoom call, you better have done some research on them. They're probably on LinkedIn or somewhere else, right? Find something that you have in common. Find something you can argue about, like baseball, right? Okay. Just find something, right? Talk to them about a real person and then listen to them, okay? Right? And if you're trying to show expertise, say, hey, I don't know whether you have this issue, but other companies I support in your industry have seen this. Is this a problem? And I don't like to use problem. Is this a challenge for you? Is this something that's occurred in your experience? And then let them talk, right? Let them talk. If you let them talk, they will take you where they want to go, all right? And if you mention a tool that you use during your prospecting call, you've already lost. <laughs> you're going down the wrong path. People love to talk about themselves. So you're right. Building true rapport, building that relationship, right? You, you don't know, like... You and I didn't know, I didn't know you were a Tampa Bay, Tampa Rays fan. You didn't know I was an Orioles fan. We knew that later on down in our relationship together. So, you know, you and I in the old days, like you go into the, you know, you wait, you, we didn't have all this technology. That's how old we are. You, you walked in the office and you kind of eyeballed the room and see what was in there to start small talking, where you talked about your local support sports team, where you talked about the weather. They're like no goes today. Like, I want to start with, like you said, I, I'm meeting with Jeremy Nelson. I'm Googling Jeremy Nelson. I'm going on LinkedIn looking for Jeremy Nelson. And then I'm going to look at his company and what his company is about. And then I'm going to start building questions around it to start to have you ask questions about your career path, your company, to get you to start opening up. And then, like you said, then you're going to get into, hey, these are, you know, questions to earn the trust around hey i know your industry a little bit here's some questions specifically for their in industry exactly people do business with people they like okay yep right that's just the way of the world and i don't care whether you're dealing with a million dollar business five hundred thousand or a hundred million dollar business i've been with businesses all over and people will, whatever the rules are, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be followed, but they will work with people they like. And if they don't like you, they're not going to do business. And they've got to trust you. Okay? They've got to trust you, and you need to be trustworthy. And you need to demonstrate that by understanding their business and what makes, what issues they have. Because there's only two reasons people, companies buy technologies, they Keith to make money or manage risk. And I've got a guy I work with who's a risk manager and he says they're lying about the second. <laughs> right? Okay? Right. So you need to acknowledge that, okay? The days of technology being cool are long gone. I don't think there are people staying up overnight waiting for the store to open to buy a Windows operating system anymore. <laughs> okay? But I was there when people did. Right? I, I remember when people lined up for iPhones. Oh, yeah. Nobody cares. Nobody yeah, cares. Just, yeah, just go. Right? It's line. a tool. And they right. want to make sure, your job is to make sure they are using the right technology tool to meet their business needs that is economically appropriate for that company. And by the way, if you haven't missed it because I buried the lead, that's your value. And that cannot be, as you said, Keith, it cannot be commoditized because it's your expertise. You hire a lawyer or an accountant because they're an expert in what you need them to do. And that's why you pay those fees. And it's not that money isn't important in those relationships, but it is not one of the top three deciding factors. Yeah, one of the, one of the cool things about working for PAX 8 is we get to talk to people across the globe. Right, this podcast, you know, U.S. Right, you and I are in the U.S. You know, relationships in the U.S. are easy compared to other areas in in the world. 
I, I coach a partner that, you know, I got a partner, that's in, a couple partners in Canada, one that's in the UK, and it's more than just a business relationship. It's a friendship. My partner in the UK, he knows it's time to talk business when the word mates come out. When you start calling each other mates, you're, you're, you know you've built a friendly relationship. You go into the Asian market, you, you've got to be like almost family before business is done. So, you know, in the U.S., when we're talking rapport, it is just, you know, understanding the other person. You know, friendships, if you look at the, you know, just look at friendships. Like, you're, you're, you're not good friends if you don't know much about each other, if you don't invest in one another. So if we want to be business friends, we need to invest by understanding and asking questions about that person's business, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, to add to that, I, one of my, ter my territory when I was selling, uh, uh, working for that hardware manufacturer was Latin America. And that's a whole different type of stuff. They're much more formal down there. If you're not wearing a, a suit coat and a tie, you, you are not going to be discussed. Okay? It's just not going to happen. So everybody has different things they need to know. But the bottom line of all of that is you need to show that you care about their success. Okay? If you care about their success, and if you're a good business person and a good IT provider, you darn well should, right? Okay? You should be taking good care of your prospects and your clients as you acknowledge that, look, I'm here to figure out whether I can help you. A good attorney will not take you on as a client if they don't think they can help you, right? A good accountant should turn you down. And then I'll leave you with this and answer any final questions you got for me, Keith. MSPs often have a misunderstanding about their market and their capacity. It's a proven practice in our industry that whether you're a million dollar MSP or a $10 million MSP, you can really only handle about 24 clients a year at most, right? Because it takes a lot to onboard you, right? Now, the clients are bigger at 10 million than the right, but if you're getting the right clients, you can only really handle 24. So, when you're talking to a prospect, I want you to have that mentality. I've only got 24 slots available, and I darn well want to make sure that I'm putting the right company in one of those 24. Because if I don't, now I only have 23, and <laughs> I'm going to have this slot filled with somebody who's not a good, pro good fit, not profitable, sucking a lot of time up. All right. We want to get to the point where people listen to our recommendations. So why not start at the very beginning and, and go on, when, you, when you sit down and qualify them and you start going through things, asking the right questions. So some of the stuff we talk about with like results selling framework is our emphasis should be squarely on the customer's needs like you and I talked about. Specifically, where they are today, what problems they're having today. Uh, I talk to people a lot about like, hey, when you find a problem, let's not just skim over it. You know, I, I call it picking the scab. I want to go deeper. So if they have a problem like, for example, our current IT company uh, is not responsive. Well, what do you mean by non-responsive? Can you give me an example of non-responsive? Oh, it, you know, last time we called in about this, it, two days before we heard from them. Oh, that, that is non-responsive. That's horrible. You didn't even hear, get the, the acknowledged email or anything. You know, you kind of dig deeper. Hey, beside, you know, how did that impact your, prof, your productivity of your employees? What did your employees think? Let me go even deeper. Do you have an employee turnover issue because they can't do their jobs, right? I'm going to keep digging around that side, around where they are today and the impact those problems are having. And then also, hey, what are they looking like in the future? So I, I, love, I love it, Keith. And guess what you didn't do? You didn't immediately say, oh, we'll do better. That's right. Right? Oh. You, didn't, you, you, didn't, you didn't say, oh, it took them two days. We always we respond within... 10 minutes and 99% of the time or whatever it is, right? It, it's human instinct to say, hey, hey, I, I can solve that. I can do that for you. 
I, I, I resort back to the movie Braveheart. You know, Mel Gibson <laughs> standing there, his war paint all over his face, and he's just sitting there to his troops, hold, hold. I mean, the, the enemy's barreling down on him, hold, and then boom. That's when, you, you know, once you know you can solve the problems, you can solve it, which we'll get into in a future discussion is, you know, then you can go ahead and prove it and talk about yourselves. Exactly. So in talking about, like, kind of a standpoint of this, like, why is it so important to find out the impact that the the prospect or your client's problems are having on their business? Because then you can start showing them what the value is, right? I'm going to keep going back to attorneys or accountants, right? What's the value of an accountant screws your taxes up and you sign that you understand? And I don't know about you, Keith, but I sign a lot of things on my tax return. I have no clue. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm putting it out there. The IRS comes knocking. I'm sorry. All right. But I, they're complicated, right? I don't know. Right. When the attorney says that I should put this in the contract because it may, it'll save me later. Right. I kind of sort of understand. Maybe, maybe not. Right. So you need to be able to communicate that to them. Right. Understand their issues. Say that we've seen things similar to this. Right. I really don't want to be the first, <laughs> especially criminal attorney. I don't want me to be his first client. <laughs> OK, I really don't. I don't want to be his first client or their first client. Right. All right. I saw that movie. <laughs> it did not end well. Right? OK, so that's what you need to do. You need to listen more, talk less and understand it is not around your technology stack no one cares about your technology stack about except you and it, you know you've you know look we won't we're not discounting that because we've all done that we've built our stack but typically we've built the stack because it gives results the problem is we don't talk about the results we just kind of put these tools together because you know maybe we just went to a conference and we were told hey buy these tools Really, it's like, what problems does that tool solve? And how are you specialized in solving that problem? That's that's what your buyer cares about. We talked about that last week is the buyer, right? Put your your feet in the shoes of that buyer. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You know, if you go to an account, do I care what software he uses? No, right? If I'm a lawyer, do I care what billing software they use or what uh, case management software they use? No, I care that they're gonna get the they're gonna get the job done, and they know what they're talking about. Yeah, for us, for IT providers, we should want to know about what what software they use, right? That's you know that goes back to our expertise. Is like we ask a simple question around that, and then to say, hey, do you ever ever have challenges with that? What are those challenges, right? We're digging into that into that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, exactly. You said one thing is like. Hey, we want to be able to discuss this. And that's, you know, that's, you know, during that meeting, it's perfect. I want to take it to the next level is like, if you uncover the problems they're having, the impact those problems are having on their business and how they want things to look like, when you get down to the proposal and delivering a recommendation to them, one, you should be recapping everything you heard. Problem, impact the problem, the outcome they want and how you're going to solve them. And that's like front page news. That should be like one of the first few pages in your recommendations because sure. you're going to repeat that you heard them. Hey, yeah. I heard you. I understand your business. And we're here not just to provide you IT service, but to solve the, Im the impact that these problems are having on your company. The change. It, then all of a sudden... The ghosting and like, let me think about it. You know, they reduce all of a sudden. It's like less of that and more winning, right? Right. And on, on top of that, what I was going to add to that is, it's a validation. If you misheard them, now you can give you it. Hey, right. And when you when you get ready to leave that prospect, and when you come back with the proposal, right, you're going to reiterate. Hey, my understanding of our call is that these are issues that you're having, and these are things that you would really like solved. Great. Let me go back to my team let me review i know we're experts in your thing but everybody's a little different i'm going to come back with a proposal you come back with the proposal you say based on our conversation 
these are maybe our three offerings. This is the one I would recommend. And here's why, based on what you told me. Yeah. And then why is it, you know, kind of we talked about the, that piece. And then mm -hmm. the other part's the future state, right? Where do they want things to be? What do they, what does good look like to them, right? It goes to what you just said. Like, we want to be able to articulate and tell stories around how we're different. Mm -hmm. Like, if we, if they tell us stories about where they want to be, then we can recollect, like, we've already done this, right? We've already done this with other companies. And then when you get to tell that story, when it's finally your turn to talk, mm -hmm. well after you've asked these questions, boy, now, now you're just bringing it home. Yeah. 95% of the people I represent don't go to jail. I want to hear that. Right? right. I want to hear that. Right? Right? I mean, and that's the same thing, Keith, is you want to be able to articulate, hey, we've heard this issue before. I, I tell this, I do calls for some other things we Pax A Academy does, right? And I tell a client, I know nothing about cars. Okay. So when I when my car starts making a weird noise and I go to the mechanic, you know what I want the mechanic to say to me? Hey, I've heard that noise before and I know exactly how to fix it. I don't want to hear, hey, I've never seen that before. Let me Google it. Right? 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 right. So that's what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. They're going to be paying real money for you. They're going to be paying for your expertise and you better be able to deliver it. And you need to be able to demonstrate it in one meeting and with your proposal. If you will do those things, you will close a much higher percentage of people because there's a movie I watch. I don't necessarily recommend it's a little depressing, but it, the thing is the person doesn't come on the lot unless they wants to buy. Okay. If they're spending an hour with you, you've gotten to that point. They are looking to hire you. They're not wasting an hour of their time talking to you just because they have nothing better to do with their time. Yeah. Especially, like you said, if uh, you know, we go back to what James and I talked about last uh, episode, which is the buyers trying to differentiate between what they currently have and us and then between us and any other competitors that may be at the dance, right? So asking these questions about their problems, the impact of the problems, and the outcomes they want to get to the point where we're ready to tell the story. Like that's that's the key of understanding the needs, right? So that's, I think you nailed it right on the head. This is great stuff, Jeremy. Um, this should definitely give our listeners a lot to digest. Any parting thoughts? I love the, uh, let me go back to one thing. I love that you kind of went with this legal analogy I mean, have you ever watched a Law and Order episode where they went and did like the closing arguments first? Like, no, they they ask, they bring people to the stand and they ask a bunch of questions, right? That's what we're trying to do. So, any parting thoughts, final thoughts you want to, you know, around uncovering needs, this early stage of of Q and A with a, with a prospect or even a client? Yeah, I, I would say this. Well, I'll leave you with this. It is your job when you're talking to a prospect to be able to listen to them so that you can determine whether you're a good fit. And if I had listened more, I promise you I would never have signed up that car company. Okay? Right? It's hard enough to be an MSP when you're dealing with clients you understand and your team can help. Don't get so excited about the dollar signs or what you think is going to happen. All right. And then I'll leave you with this final thought that I train all my new salespeople on. Right? You didn't have the client before you walked in. So if you don't have the client when you walked out, you really haven't lost a lot. And then I'll throw a baseball analogy. You know, if you hit a fastball better than you hit a curveball, you're sitting on the fastball the entire time. If they figure out and throw you a curveball, strike you out, tip the cap, good job. But they're going to throw that fastball and you're going to hit it. That's the kind of same thing as like 
Go after, you know, life short. Work with people that you want to work with, right? Work with ones that you can provide the biggest impact to as well. Absolutely. Great stuff, Jeremy. Thanks for being here again. I know you're going to be on uh, future episodes, so can't wait to have you back. All right, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. You got it. All right. Final thoughts from this podcast. Most companies you're going to talk to have urgent issues. Maybe not most of them. Some of them will. Their IT company stinks. They're looking to make the change. Those, you know, you may get a few opportunities because of this. Few companies have urgent issues that are really hitting their company. But if you're not getting the magical one to two new clients a month, it's typically because there's not a lot of businesses out there that are just like dying to leave their current provider. However, most businesses have latent issues. They're dealing with something that's in their company, something that, you know, the challenge is how to, of how to grow their company, how to improve their business operations, how to improve their employee productivity, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, and they're looking to minimize risk. These are latent issues that every business entrepreneur goes through. So asking good business questions will help differentiate yourself from your competition. It's also going to help uncover business problems your clients and prospect want to solve. I call them problems that are like below the surface problems. So as Jeremy said, if you have an expertise around the industry itself, you're going to understand more of the problems they face instead of being a generalist. And if you want to learn more about any of this, go to Pax8 Academy and just do a search and put in the search bar RSF, the initials Robert Sam Frank. And you'll find seven courses that will help you through this. Thanks again for tuning in. Next week, we'll be discussing understanding the buyer buying process. And I'll have back James Levine for that discussion. So see you all next week. And thanks again for listening to the Sales Pitch Podcast.